We cover leadership and communication skill topics. And while these are often centered around the workplace and corporate settings, we wanted to invite a good friend of ours to shed some light on how to de-escalate tension, conflict, and have difficult conversations. We're going to take a deep dive into why de-escalation is such a critical leadership skill. We're thrilled and pleasure to have our good friend, Kit Cummings, join the program. Kit is an author, a speaker, and the visionary behind the Power Peace Project, a 501c3 organization that is committed to redirecting undeserved youth, reducing the overall incidence of youth crime, rehabilitating young inmates, lowering academic dropout rates, and inspiring young people to discover and develop untapped potential. And we believe that there's untapped potential in all of us. The Power Peace Project interrupts and redirects these young individuals who are on a course that may not be set up for their success. And it's designed to help these young individuals get put on a path to accomplishing their dreams. Kit, welcome to Twins Talk It Up. Hey, thank you so much, guys. And I'm, I'm honored to be on your show. I love what you guys do. So can't wait to get into it with you. I appreciate that, Kit. This is uh, David. And for our listening audience, from time to time throughout our conversation with you, we'll make sure to let them know who's asking you the question and who's digging for more information. Well, Kit, we've known each other for some time. You have an incredible story. I appreciate our mutual friend, Rich McGill of Elite Public Image, who said, David, you haven't had Rich, I mean, you haven't had Kit, rather, on your program. You've got to get him on. He's doing incredible work. And there are incredible leadership lessons that you could apply to any level of leadership. And so, Kit, in our training, Dan and I, from time to time, cover what's known as the elevator pitch. And this is designed to help professionals introduce themselves, their product, and their service. It's designed to get the audience to say, tell me more. So, Kit, tell our audience, what is your elevator pitch so we can get to know who you are and what the Power Peace Project is? All right, fair enough. Great question. All right, it's like, hey, what's going on? What's going on, man? So, what do you do? <laughs> that that pitch, correct? Yep. I typically say something like, uh, I work with knuckleheads. And just let it sit there for a second. <laughs> and then I'll say, but seriously, you know, as the, the champion for the knuckleheads, I work with those that, that we're afraid of and mad at. Um, my specialty is bringing rivals together. And I work with people that are on their way to trouble, in trouble, or have gotten in trouble. And so uh, it's prevention, intervention, and suppression. And so I write books and I speak about it and I teach and I coach and uh, run a nonprofit. So that's what I do. What do you do? <laughs> this is Danny. I love that. Thank you very much, uh, Kit, for bringing that out. And it's really awesome. It's very specific. You state what you do, how you do it. And that's the reason why. Many times people will go on and on and on forever but they never get to the point of why they do what they do and what they're doing. And so we really appreciate you breaking that down. And I want to let our audience know that this is a great opportunity. Corporate America, non-corporate America, today's topic is going to help you learn how to de-escalate. This is going to be amazing. So to follow up on that, can you tell us a little bit more about the Power of Peace Project? What it is, how did this become your passion, and how did it become your mission? And then how did you get this idea of 40 Days of Peace? <laughs> Great. Um, it, I, I promise you, it wasn't something I aspired to when I was young. You know, I'm going to work with gangs and I'm going to, you know what I'm saying? Um, it was something, it, it, I think I got to the place where I was destined to be. And there's a lot of ways we can get to that place. But the point is to get to that place and, and figure out what's my God given unique gift, you know, that I have naturally. And where does the world need that gift? And then magic happens. And so, a lot of times it's not, most times it's not the way, the direct route that we would, you know, pick to go to our passion. Um, for me, it was a series of failures and poor choices. So, you know, I was the least likely guy to become a preacher growing up. Nobody saw that coming. I shocked the world at 25 because I was wild. There wasn't many things that I did not do, you know, have not done in life. I will not be an old man on his deathbed regretting the things that he did not try because I got around to just about all of it. And so, uh, but it, you know, it was unsustainable and, you know, through some family things, addiction, um, you know, I just got to the end of my rope, you know, it was burnout age 25, 
found out I had a gift, you know, I mean, I fell in love with God, got in front of a church, magic happened. I said, this is what I'm supposed to do. How quick can I get there? And that led to this 15 year ride um, in the full-time ministry as a preacher and pastor and minister, um, led some large churches, you know, was responsible for thousands and um, it was a heady thing. <laughs> I loved it and I did it with all my heart, like I do everything, but I burn out at the age of 40, you know, my, my talent outran my character. And I found myself in a really, really tough place. And that guy from back in the day, oh, he came back. <laughs> he had been doing push-ups in the parking lot <laughs> waiting on me. And so anyway, I went through a real storm at 40 and 41 and, um, and then had a, what we call a moment of clarity and an awakening. And I decided, you know, I can't, I can't put another drop in my body. And so in December of 2005, I had my last drink and that set me up to, figure out what was next but I had this weird five-year period where I'm like I'm sober I, I don't get to preach anymore I'm hustling doing mortgage bank I mean do I look like a mortgage banker <laughs> you know insurance real estate I mean God bless anybody that's out there hustling man I feel you but I but I what do you do when you lose the thing you're supposed to do on the planet and you know for, you know that you know that's not what you're supposed to do and then you squander it I'm a prodigal son for real for real squandered it all and i'm out there now i'm sober i'm miserable <laughs> it's like you know and then i prayed a prayer it changed my life and it's if you ever let me preach again i'll go to the ones nobody wants to talk to and i said the hungry the thirsty the naked the stranger the sick the prisoner and then through a series of miraculous you know seemingly consequential meetings that is are coincidental um man, I fell right into it. And I started working with a kid that I knew, you know, he's a kingdom kid, what we called him, these church kids. And, and then I, I lost him for 10 years, came back and he was a gang leader uh, looking at a gang related murder charge, MS-13. Any of our listeners know who they are. And so I just went ride or die with him. And we, two years through the glass, man, I'm studying with him and he's teaching me everything that I've can't find out about the gang life. I mean, civilians do not get to know what I was just getting bombarded with. And so, you know, his transformation changed my life. And I wrote a book, 2010. I walked into a prison and just fell in love. And I kept going, I kept going, I kept going. I did that one even with even more heart than I had done anything in my life. And, you know, it led me to a hundred prisons around the world. And, you know, jails, detention centers, rehab facilities fulfilling that promise that I made to him, that I will go and preach. You invite me, I will go. And I go where I'm invited. It took me into third world prisons and, and Honduras and Mexico and South Africa and Ukraine and across the country. And, and I'll kind of wrap with this, Danny. Um, it's, it's basically a program that I think was divinely inspired, but work that I replicated and really continued to evolve. It brings rival prison gangs together 40 days at a time and teaches them how to work to together to bring about peace. And now I'm doing juvenile prisons and it's the work of my life. That's wonderful, Kit. This is David. And I love that you were able to find a path that made sense and that can impact so many people. And we all know the statistics, or at least we've heard the statistics about the American prison system and how so many young people get lost. And in so many ways, that might be their destiny, but in reality, it's not. And that's what you've done. And I appreciate your ability to answer that call to say, hey, I'm going to go in there. We're going to talk about peace. We're going to talk about how to help change the path of these young people. Um, you, you interestingly have enough, what we talk about, the foundation of faith, you have something called the seven power and peace of peace project principles. Uh, can you talk about what these seven principles are, Kit, and why it's so important to be able to adhere to those when it comes to implementing your vision of this program? Yes, thank you. Um, it was it was basically necessity. Okay, I was serving in the toughest prison in the state of Georgia. I'd never done maximum. I'd never done any prisons, and now all of a sudden I'm going once a week, and then twice a week, and then I'm writing and and I'm building this little crew. And there was twelve of us that signed what became for me a historic peace pledge on Dr. King's birthday in 2011. And um, twelve men. We had a crip, a blood, a gangster disciple, a Latin king, a Muslim brother, Christian brother an Aryan Brotherhood brother. All right, we had all the players and we just were cool. We were talking about what would it take to bring peace to the toughest prison in the state where it's just like, I mean, it's, I mean, all the time it was bad. Still is, very, very dangerous. 
And we caught a dream together. And so I went to, to Philadelphia to speak at a Hope Conference because they were interested in this whole prison ministry. Nobody was doing it. And, uh, and I spoke. And afterwards, Antonio Boyd got up and he, he put a picture of Dr. Martin Luther King on the screen and who I've been following for 25 years. God got me on that young when I didn't even know why. And he challenged us to go back to our cities and do something in honor of Dr. King for his 25th annual MLK Day, which was the following month. And so I went back and I'm like, we're going to do a peace pledge in honor of Dr. King. And I, on the plane, I was just scribbling down what became the foundation of this project. And I went back and pitched it to the warden. He shot it down, told me I better not do it. I went and pitched it to my little 12, told them to keep it under the one. <laughs> they didn't. They went out and told everybody, kind of like when Jesus said don't tell anybody that's it was on and so after I got into a little bit of trouble he let me start managing it and we built a peace movement and this prison won prison of the year that year in the state of Georgia wow it was founded on these principles and these are you know a hundred of the most influential men in the prison at a time the, the ones that don't do programs and so it seek first to understand your opponent okay you're doing it right now we're not opponents I'm the other you're seeking first to understand me, right? And that is the start. And with gang leaders, I'm like, go ahead and seek first to understand your enemy. It's just a good way to do it. I don't care what you do. You're going to be better at what you do. Dr. King said he's going to be an expert and know your position better than you do, All right? It's just smart. Two, find common ground with your enemy. And it's like now, now you use opponent, enemy, adversary, because we're in a prison gang setting, but, you know, in a corporate America, be the other, right? Or the opponent of the prospect, you know, the competitor, you know, that person you work with, it gets on your last nerve. Find common ground with that person because we have so much more in common than what separates us. And then all of a sudden we start seeing one another. Imagine a bunch of rival gang members at a table and you're starting to practice these and try to find there, there's a whole lot more that, that we're alike. Mm -hmm. Three is walk a mile in the other man's shoes before you judge him. Okay, you don't get to judge until you walk a mile. That's what we're going to do at those tables. We're walking a mile with one another. Tell me about this. Tell me about this. What was the greatest day of your life? The toughest day of your life? Tell me where you're going to be 10 years from now. Make it the best thing you can think of. And we just start walking with one another. And we practice for active listening and pause before responding. You guys are active listening right now. You're both doing nonverbal cues. You're smiling. Your energy is good. You're sitting up straight. You're paying attention. It's like, that's what we teach them to do. It's like, it's just smart. I don't care if you're going to keep gang banging. This will make you more effective. Take that as you will. You understand what I'm saying. It's like, I've got to start there. It's like, because they ain't trying to be a peacemaker on day one. Right. But they practice the principles. They get caught up in it and start seeing each other different. Five is use deliberate language and use your influence for peace. You're going to practice using your words like Dr. King did. He was a wordsmith. Maya Angelou, they study her. It's like every word had its place. And words are much more powerful than the sword. We know this. And so we teach them that. And then six, when you're wrong, promptly admit it and quickly make amends. And so we teach, hey, a real man takes responsibility when he makes a mistake, man. It ain't weak. And you don't have to do it all fluffy. You can just look at a dude and say, my bad. That's it. Okay, you just did that. All right, so I'm giving them just simple ways to try to practice. And the last one is treat your enemies with dignity and respect, especially when you disagree. <laughs> it's like, what if we did that in today's world? It's much easier, and I mean this, brothers, with all my heart. It's much easier for me to bring Crips and Bloods together, blue and red, than it is Democrats and Republicans, blue and red. Shoot, I can get Crips and Bloods to get along. So that's how we do it. Wow, Kit, this is David. I'm telling you, this is such an incredibly deep conversation. I love these seven principles. And even at the very end, you said, look, the people you don't think can get it together and make something happen, I could get those guys to get together and talk. I could get those guys to get together and see a common picture, but there are some things you can't get done, you can't get resolved, and that's so convicting. Yeah. Oh, well, my goodness. Is, I mean, if we practiced it, we could do it. You give, me, <laughs> you give me six Republicans, six Democrats, give me 40 days and small groups in the middle, and I probably, we can get together. I love it. I love it. And that's true, and that's really the whole point here is that any – type of tension that's out there can be de-escalated. It can come to a peaceful resolution 
if you remember some of these core principles, I, I, I was so moved when you said, seek first to understand. We want so much to put our opinion, our perspective, our thoughts, our judgment, our rubber stamp. Our, our This is what we want you to say. You got to see us first before we can hear you. No, the reality is if you stop where you are and you seek to understand, that breaks down a lot of those barriers. That breaks down those walls of hostility. I love how you said that. And that really inspires me. Uh, Kit, let, let, me, let me go into something that's really interesting because not only have you been a preacher and uh really a pastor of peace. You've authored many, many books, six books, I believe, including your award-winning Peace Behind the Wire and Nonviolent Resolution. And this book has been endorsed by the King family. And I believe one of your more recent books, if not your latest book, is called The New Convict Code, Bringing Peace to the Streets from Behind the Wire. In this book, you flip the script on what prison reform is and really what it could be and how you want to break this pipeline, shatter this pipeline that goes from schools, the education system, to prison. Can you talk about the story behind what inspired you to write this book and how bringing ideas and, and stories that you put in this book, how this can help change this growing epidemic of crime and violence for our young people today? Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, after being in over 100 facilities and working with over 10,000 prisoners, <laughs> I saw a lot. I see not just what the brothers do, but the culture, and I see the threats, I see the violence, I see the way security operates, I see the us against them with the, the inmates and the staff and, and the culture of prison in America, which we call the U.S. prison industrial complex because it is money, a hundred billion dollar a year industry, man, and going private. <laughs> and, you know, if I, if I go buy a prison from the state and we're going to go into contract together, they have to guarantee me that they're going to keep at least 85% of their beds filled at all time or, when, or it's a no deal, it's a deal breaker contractually. Now that means that now we are incentivized to fill up prisons, right? And then I could go down the line about all the things that, I mean, our country has made big business out of prisons. The other places that we go to, they're not like that around the world. We have 4% of the population. We lock up 25% of the incarcerated. We got two out of every three are getting out and revoke, being revoked or reoffending and coming back. It's a broken system built to fail. And so I had to write about it. And what's different about the, those two books, Peace Behind the Wire and the, and the New Convict Code, is it's real stories from real convicts. And I use that word respectfully. Convict is a badge, you know, on the inside. You're not an inmate. You're a convict. You've learned how to do the time where you want to do it. And so they've taught me so many things, this convict code. And so I use real stories that are fascinating stories, but then they underline the principles that I believe are the, is the way to reform this broken system. And I'm, I'm getting a chance to prove my principles on a big stage right now. I'm contracted with the uh, Department of Juvenile Justice here in my state of Georgia. And the commissioner who I've gotten a great working relationship with has put me in his toughest juvenile prison. So I'm working with 16 to 20 year old violent felons, affiliated gang members, um, predominantly bloods at this prison. And it's, it's who we say is the toughest, the 17, 18 year old mind today. I don't care where they are. If they're in prep school, it's a tough generation to, to connect with, but these are the toughest kids in the state. And I'm getting to prove the things that I, that I, that I saw work in the adult system, but now in, in a broken juvenile system, and I'm seeing miracles again. And it's based on, it's so simple. Reward is more powerful than punishment. Offer them reward. We set up a system how you can, you can get incentives instead of just lock them down. Um, agreements are so much more powerful than rules. Okay, tell them to obey the rules and they're like, make me. But if it's an agreement, hey, this is the reward. All right, let's make an agreement. What do I got to do to get that reward? Now, all of a sudden, there's a bridge and we're talking. Empower them to be the solution. Be amazed. I mean, I asked the hardest guys, hey, will you help me? I can't do this without you. If we bring peace to the prison, here's what's in it for you. Now, will you help me? And they're like, nobody's ever asked what you want us to do. And then once that they get the reward, here's the magic. Now they have something to protect. And so I say protect it. The boys down at Eastman, the juvenile correctional place I go down to every Wednesday, they just earned their PlayStations back. 
Okay, that was their number one thing when I polled them. What can I do for you? Get us our games back. And so we've been working on that. It took us nine months. They got their games back. Now they got something to do. They ain't going to fight as much or throw stuff on the guards when they're, when they're you know, doing the things they love. So it's, it's those things. So I, I wrote those books to tell the world about the state that we're in without throwing wardens and commissioners under the bus or governors, but saying this is what it is and here are what I believe are the solutions. This is Danny. I remember when I went to Howard University and we had, um, back in the day, Madden first came out <laughs> and we were playing Madden. So all we did was play three games. We played Madden, Bones, or Spades. So I, I can't imagine. <laughs> yeah, I, mean. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine waiting nine months to get their games back. That's, uh, that's amazing. Uh, two things stand out to me that you had said, which I thought was very interesting, and it really applies uh, to corporate America as well. Seek first to understand. I thought that was quite amazing. And a lot of times I deal with technical leaders, technical managers, and we have to teach a class on leading with empathy. Uh, a lot of people are just don't know how to be, don't know how to, to really relate to the people on their team. And I love this other thing that you said, find common ground. You do not get to judge until you walk a mile in that person's mm -hmm. shoes. So those, that's very powerful. Thank you for saying that. Um, one of the things I think is very important to let our audience know is that these are principles that are very vital. And what Kid said earlier is that he can have people who are in gang rivals come to peace quicker than people who are in opposite political parties. And how true that is. That is, that is crazy. If, we can, if gangsters can become peacemakers, why can't managers, directors, VPs, your own peers at the workplace, why can't they become peacemakers as well? Let's talk about a topic that is relevant no matter where you are at. No matter what industry you're in, no matter what conflict you're going through, and what kind of resolution you want to have, let's just say this really important statistic. We know that it's been shown that people leave organizations not because they don't like the work they do, not because they don't like the peers, but because of bad management, bad leadership. It is toxic. It is very stressful for people, and they get up and they leave. They know this one thing. Man, you're pushing my buttons. You know exactly what buttons to push. I'm walking out the door. So. What buttons can we think about when it comes to corporate America? What buttons can we relate when it comes to the streets? How can you stand up for yourself? How can you not back down, but yet demonstrate actions or behavior that can lead to peaceful resolution? And you do this every single day, Kit, because a lot of times we're like, I got to swallow my pride. I'm, I'm, I'm who I am. I'm not going to change who I am. So how can you get people to not worry about the buttons getting pushed, but yet thinking about how they can still come to peace without backing down and losing themselves. Because I think a lot of times people talk about respect, even in the workplace, they talk about respect. So how do you help these individuals still feel pride in themselves without losing their own respect? Yeah, well, if I can touch on the first thing mm -hmm. about someone's in a management position, you know, people leave because of poor management. Um, you know, one of the, the mantras that we use, we have, we have powerful mantras that the brothers learn. And sisters too. I've done some, you know, beautiful women's prisons. Um, is I see, I see you, I feel you, I got you. Okay. And so we we do it in a way that young people can understand that, you know, it's kind of our colloquialism. So it's like I see you as I respect you. Okay. I see you. I see the real you. You might be acting a fool, but I see you. I know who you are. And so that's the first thing. If I'm working with these tough kids or tough men in the toughest places, all the way to death row. I've got friends on death row. I've lost three friends to a lethal injection. You know what I'm saying? The first step, and you can't fake this, is I see you. I respect you. I'm coming into this relationship with respect. And I've had to practice these principles because I work in places where if I do not practice these principles, I could get hurt. And so it's, it's, it's been wonderful because I've practiced these things until they become natural. And so... The, the lower someone is on the scale, who Jesus called the least of these, the lesser, they need more respect than the governor. They need it. The governor gets it all day long. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respect those. And I'm kind of answering your question in an indirect way, because this is what we're modeling and teaching them, is I'm going to respect the least of these even more. Okay, so when I go into a prison, it's a, it's a sacred space. And it is it is. Nice to meet you, sir. It's a bow of the head. It's it's grabbing both, using two hands to shake 
shake his hands. Good to meet you, sir. And meaning it, I see you. I feel you as compassion. I really feel you, man. I've never been in prison. I got arrested a handful of times when I was young and dumb, but I never had to change my clothes. So I don't know what it feels like to live in there, but man, it hurts me to see it. And I've got to, they, that's a vibe, energy. You can't fake energy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want to be a good leader, a man, you manage your energy, man. And then, you know, I, I feel you because we even say that in our language. You feel me? You feel me? You feel me? People are dying to be felt. Do you understand me? I know you see me, but you feel me. Okay. And then the last one is I, I, I got you. I see you. I feel you. I got you. That's loyalty, man. I got your back. These things are just $2 words in the free world. If I don't disrespect somebody, I might lose a friend. If I'm not compassionate with somebody when they're going through, they just might not call me next time. If I say, hey, bro, I'll meet you at two and I don't show up, well, then they're just kind of mad at me. You did those things behind the wire and you got problems. This place where you have to practice these things, right? Wow. And so, you know, what we're teaching the brothers is we got to start with that. As I see you, I feel you, you know, we'll work on I got you. But as a manager, as a leader, that's what people want respect them find out that's why i found out from those kids and from the adults what do you want what would make your life better and i want to know that and now i'm going to feel you and now i got you i'm going to go to work on that so i start working with the warden to say how can we get these games back this is a big deal you want to lower violence give me that well they got to earn it what do they got to do and then i go back to the other party here's what he's saying you got to do you got to work with them now I mean, you don't want to make the first move. How bad you want your games back? Give me something. And they make a move. And I go back. Now I get them in a circle, get the dialogue going. That will work with loan officers. <laughs> that would work with, hey, man, a manager that that is is a servant leader for real, for real. It's that's easy to follow somebody. It's hard to leave somebody like that. I mean, he's got my back. No, he's getting me. He's making my life better because he cares about, he feels me. He knows we're, we're being squeezed by this economy, man. He's got my back. I, I don't know. If, I went all over the place, Danny. <laughs> I don't know if I answered that. No, I appreciate that. This is Danny. And you did a great job answering the, the question because it really comes down to the three things that you said. Um, and I really want to make sure our audience understands this because this applies to corporate America. And, and you, you said something very simple. I see you. I feel you. I got you. And I think a lot of times in corporate America, what an employee really needs to know is that the manager feels you, sees you, and got you. And that's really important. And it makes a person work harder. It's that reward system. And if the, if, if the person feels valued and they mm -hmm. feel heard, they're going to work so much more harder. They're going to work so much more effectively. They're going to be so much more passionate because they have their back. And that's really so important. So I love how you're taking simplified principles and you are applying it every day in a very hostile situation to, to make it not hostile. And then that all in turn works in corporate America. It's just the simplest principles. That, that's I love Jesus' teachings, everything Jesus does. It's just a very simplistic teaching. And it's about showing respect and love. You said, hey, I've never been in your situation. I've never been there, but I got you. I feel you. I see you. And man, that drops a lot of walls. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. And thank you very much for addressing that, Kit. Yes, sir. Um, Kit, this is David. I, I want to follow up on this because this is really exciting to be able to hear that it doesn't have to be overcomplicated. It doesn't have to be that difficult. It doesn't have to be the barriers you might put in your mind. You can actually break those down and have a conversation. You can learn to respect somebody and build that bridge. So you also mentioned about maintaining the right type of energy. You're, you're, you're being a person of integrity. When you say you're going to do something, you do it. And trust goes a long way to making that happen. I want to ask you about your Power Peace Project and knowing that your vision has caught like a wildfire with so many other people who've gotten on board. And you might naturally hear this and say, whoa, no, 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 Kit's, Kit's allies are, are, there's no way he has an advocate that's in leadership position. There's no way he has police and cops and, and, and legislators that are on his team. No, Kit, you've got a wide and vast team. Talk about the importance of diversity of your team, people like Brother Brown, some of the delegates and people you work with in the state of uh, Georgia. Uh, talk about the importance of having team members from different backgrounds with the same shared vision. Yeah, 
thank you for that. Um, it was me against the world for a while. You know what I'm saying? When I, you know, my, my fall from grace was public. And because it's my town, I've been in and around Atlanta for 58 times around the sun. And so, you know, you can't hide. And so I had to face it, face the music, you know what I'm saying? And, um, but then I had a chip on my shoulder. <laughs> I was like, I had something to say, you know, because I had, I had gone away and I'd come back. And, um, and so I went out there and I started to do it. And then it was just this wild ride of, of, you know, flying planes, trains and automobiles everywhere. And as I spread this thing and I was trying to figure out how do I survive doing this and how do I keep my marriage together on the road? It was just this whirlwind. And I had this little paper board, you know, which is legal, but I could make moves as soon as I wanted to fast because it was like a movement. You can't sit around and have meetings to have meetings to have meetings about a movement. It's moving. And so, but then about five, six years ago, I just got to the end of me <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> I got it. I can keep doing this, but I need people around me this is unsustainable once again i was i was sober but getting to that place man you got i got to be careful with me i like to run fast and so um you know somebody can't keep up it's like all right see you later <laughs> you know some people would get on the ride for a while and, phew, uh, my ministry uh, you know my ministry is closely patterned after paul's paul's ministry was different than all the rest of them you know and so anyway i say that and then i took one of my greatest gifts and i can't brag about it because i didn't i didn't earn it it, it was given to me <laughs> i came into the world with it you know through my family line and then god's grace and he gifts us with he attaches a, a beautiful gift to every soul the purpose in life is, is to figure out what that gift is and the meaning excuse me the meaning of life is to find that gift the purpose is to give it away you know what i'm saying i can make friends really well and i love doing it Try not to be my friend, I dare you. And so I will figure it out. And then I just love it. I love people and I practice these principles, but I'm not sitting there trying to figure out what's the practice, what the principle It's just kind of like, man, I love living life this way. So the reason I have such a great relationship with the state of Georgia is because I've become good friends with the commissioner. We're cool like that. Another brother that's a, um, a house rep, you know, he's a representative here in the state of Georgia, very influential guy. We're friends. We're really friends. The former czar of prisons, the federal prison system of America under the last administration, he's my friend. Police chiefs, I got him on speed dial. I mean, right now, I hit a chief up. Hey, chief, we got a question for you. We're on the air. And they're going to pick up. And those are busy, busy men. And so uh, they're my friends. And I worship with some of them and I, I value the relationship. So I think now things are more doors are opening and they're bigger doors because I think we is better than me. You know what I'm saying? And I've got to always be careful of my nature because I do not mind working alone. You give me access to a prison, give me the hundred men I want to work with and we will start a peace movement. I don't need any help. Okay. That's my nature. <laughs> I got to be careful with that. Um, I want to ask you this question. When you are talking about making friends easily, how important is it to have uh, this body language of uh, kind of like an openness or kind of like, hey, look, I'm not threatening. Uh, what type of body language do you need to have day in, day out when you're working with uh, individuals in these situations? Because I think it can actually also, this nonverbal language can also apply in corporate America. So tell us a little bit about that, because a person who says, I, I challenge you not to like me, not to be my friend, uh, I'm sure you have certain tips on body language and posture before you even say a word uh, to get somebody to drop their guard when they meet, me, meet with you. Can you share that with our audience a little bit, please? Yeah, these are so great questions. I have so much fun with this one. And I'm not going to tell people to ever do what I do if they're in a prison, but you can do it in the free world. <laughs> you can definitely do it. But I have a, a very childlike spirit. It just is how I've always been. I never, ever, I'm just, I, my energy is young. Energy does not have an age. Energy always has been, always will be. And so anyway, I, I, I have a playful childlike energy. And so I love my first impressions, especially in prison. 
it's because you got guys that are hard. You know, they're, they're just, they're not trying to, you know, hey, good to meet you. And so it's a great challenge. But if there's 100 men in the room, I'm going to make sure that I, I get into personal contact with all 100 of them before we start. Okay, there's going to be personal contact. And the initial one is going to be that of respect. You know what I'm saying? But I tell you, the first break, a couple hours later, everybody's milling around. We ain't started yet. I'm going to start figuring out who's who. And I'm even going to do a little research and say, who's my guy? And I'm going to figure out who the guys are that I need to get close to. And then I'm going to start playing right away. They're going to understand the nature of our relationship. So I'll go over and just kind of stand there and they'll be talking. And I'll, and I'll just act like I'm, and then I'll just make a joke. I'll say, hey, bro, I heard about you. And he'll go, what are you talking about? So I just heard, man, this guy, right? He told me, you know, and I just might, whatever comes up, or I'll come up and kind of bump a guy from the side and he'll, he'll turn around and I'll say, Am I the only one that gets away with that? They go, damn right it is. You know, and all of a sudden I got this cool little vibe. I just use playful energy and humor after respect is established. Now, here's a disclaimer. You can't fake this. And so I tell people, do you, whatever your energy is, whatever your beautiful energy is, when everything's cool, you want to get to that. I mean, my, don't try to be me. I can't try to be you. You know what I'm saying? Everybody... But I think the energy thing, think about that. If we translate that into corporate America, yeah. energy and attitude and body language reflects energy. I mean, a fast moving energy literally lifts you off the ground. Why, why do we jump for joy? Slow moving energy literally pulls you down. Why do we go to bed and curl up and dark and cold? It's the vibrational frequency of energy. And so if you're not willing to learn to manage your mindset, which controls the energy and chemistry um how are we going to effectively lead and if i can't reach i want these guys after spending two three hours with me to be like that that dude is a trip i want to <laughs> i want to come back and see more because they're not impressed with the same old things and i'll say this and wrap on this question is leaders today that are using the same tricks they did two or three years ago good luck good luck it's just, uh, I'd love to see how long you're going to be able to sustain that because it, <laughs> otherwise don't be a leader. I mean, really, if you're going to stand up there, you got to stay fresh. I mean, the, the things I was doing with juveniles three years ago is obsolete now. It's like, I've got to recreate myself. And I learn from the people that I, that I'm teaching and coaching, especially young people. They teach me so much and I'm not afraid to ask, teach me. That's how awesome. I have that's how I happened to win the respect of awesome. the imams and the Muslims in prisons is I, I come with respect and say, hey, you mind when I come on Thursdays, if me and you get a few minutes, I just want to chat. And it's like, yeah, what you need, bro? It's like, I want you to teach me things about Islam that I don't know because I need to know. And I don't fake it. It's sincere. You don't think he's ready to see me on Thursdays? <laughs> now I got the most powerful Muslim in the prison that's become my mentor. Yeah. That's awesome. This is Danny. I love how you set that up so that the person is looking forward to seeing you. Yeah, yeah. Managers, take note of that. When you're dealing with employees and you're going to have a one-on-one -on -one with them, typically employees are like, oh my gosh, I have a one-on-one, -on -one, regularly scheduled one-on-one. -on -one. He, he or she is going to make me feel bad for not hitting my numbers. But you can turn it around to where they're actually looking forward yeah. to meeting with you. I love that. I also love how you can get 100 people in the room and everybody's going to instantly, you know, just you're going to get to work the room. Everyone's going get to get to know you. Everyone's going to go, going to get to understand you. You Like you said, you'll bump into somebody and, and say, hey, man, who's that person? Whatever it may be. I think it's very important that people who are speaking at conferences, managers who are going to be speaking in a room full of employees, before you speak, before you, they even announce who you are, walk the room. Yeah. Get to know who's there. Who's, who's the big dog in the room? Who's the person that is the most recognizable person? Who's the one that deserves the most recognition for the work that he or she has done? Walk through them, get to know people so that when you speak, you come across authentic. You come across very real. A lot of leaders get up in their speak. You're like, oh my gosh, it's a teleprompt. Oh my gosh, I'm reading a script. Oh my gosh, it sounds so robotic. But one way you cannot be robotic is get to know people. Walk around the room. When they believe that you are sincere and that you care about them, they will listen more intently. They will actually turn their head and, and lean in a little bit more and say, tell me more. 
But nobody wants to say, tell me more when they don't feel like you're real and you're authentic. So Kit, thank you very much for sharing that. I want to honestly know, hey, these principles, mm. they work in corporate America every single day. And if you could just apply a couple of the things here and there, just be real, just be authentic. I guarantee you, you don't have to wait 50, 58 years around the sun. <laughs> People are going to love you. They're going to like you. They're going to instantly be attracted to spending time with you. So, Kit, thank you very much for sharing that. I, I think those are great, great, valuable, uh, just nuggets of wisdom that you're sharing with everybody. Amen. Thank you. Kit, this is David, and I appreciate some of the things you've been sharing with our audience and really sharing with us. And I love how you mentioned you have to be authentic. You have to be genuine because they can sniff it out. They could tell when you're there for a different agenda other than really caring about their well-being, caring about the future of their children, the people that they've touched. Uh, as a fellow pastor, we, we, we know what it means to be called as something that's beyond ourselves. It's something greater than just us. And the truth be told, we could all be evangelists of something. And so I've heard you state before, and, get, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, but I believe I heard you say this before, that you weren't going to prisons to bring God to them. Because a lot of other people do that, ministers, I got to save people. But you said you were going there to help them find God in themselves. Talk about what that means to help individuals understand the potential of greatness within them understand that they have the ability to become a powerful peacemaker. How do you help them to see the best in themselves so that they can in turn see the best in other people? Okay. It, this was something that I needed, not that I developed. And so the things that I I teach from experience and when I preach and I get invited to preach at churches and I do a, I've got a 40 days of prayer series for, for, you know, training series for churches and stuff. It's like I'm speaking from experience and I decided I'll never preach about anything anymore if I can't preach from my experience. <laughs> That's just me. We need teachers and we need pastors. For me, it's got to be something that, oh man, I've been through that. Now I want to talk about it through the lens of what it is, you know, that that we're studying. And so um, that's when I when I come in and I say, you know, I'm not trying to come in here and bring God to you. I'm trying to come in here and find God in you. Mm. That was a need that I had because, see, I had, through my own choices, I had burned down, you know, what I had built. <laughs> Family, ministry, relationships, I mean, were just in, in, in shambles. And there was a lot of shame there. And so I wasn't trying to go back to church. <laughs> no, nah, I mean, that all I felt like felt like was judgment and gossip and slander is coming from there, man. Too much shame and pain. Now nah, I'm going to go somewhere else. And then I, I happened to just kind of fall into this <laughs> prison situation. They became my safe place. Now think about that. I needed a safe place to preach. And it turned out it was maximum security prisons with gangsters. And they became my congregation. And I started seeing Matthew 25 different. I'm like, <laughs> the sheep and the goats, uh-oh. I've preached a lot about that, but I ain't experienced much of it. And yet he said, whatever you do for them, you do for me. Well, well the prisoner is the least of the least, is the end of the line. Whatever I do for him is how I'm really treating God. So I'm like, I'm going to treat them with ultimate respect. And so I came in and I, and I cried in front of them. And I, I thanked them for saving my life. And I... You know, my my whole ministry is a thank you tour, trying to keep that promise I made to him and rightly telling them, you saved my life. That's how important you are. You embrace me. I'm a made man. I've got all the major gangs that give me respect, that they they I'm family to them. I'm untouchable. That's the truth because they know how hard I love them. And so that chain, they changed me more than anybody has ever changed me besides Jesus, my father, my mother, Dr. King, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? These guys, they're like that. And so it is sacred when I get to go into prison and those brothers, man, they're powerful. And I've learned this, <laughs> let's take it to corporate again. If you've got a misfit band of knuckleheads that you're in charge of managing in a tough economy that none of us have ever really seen, this never happened, we're experiencing things, we ain't got no reference point to go back and say, well, here's how we handled the last time. This is this is all new. And so, you know, I've got to, 
<laughs> continue to to recreate myself and continue to to need them and so you know if i'm if i'm managing people hopefully somehow if i'm going to feel them if i see them if i've got them then i'm going to be able to relate to them mm. that, that i've been through this you know what i'm saying that i'm with you and then i'm not saying be a sappy kind of heartsy fluffy Duh. you can be strong in the same way if you're a type a if you're a left brain if you are analytical that's cool but still i'm going to see the people the way i want them to be I'm meeting with a cartel soldier on a field in Tijuana because I need that field and I know I can't have my event if I don't have protection from this new cartel called the new generation that holds that part of town and I got to meet with that brother real story I better come with the right energy and I am looking for God in him and there's something about a human being when you look at them like that they know it even if their brain doesn't know it their spirit knows it and they know they're being respected and then People will do amazing things when they feel respected. I mean, that's just truth. And so you want to mobilize a bunch of misfits. That's what I do all day long, every day. Man, truly see them the way you want them to be and then call them to it, as opposed to seeing all the things that you don't like about them, which is what most people are going to do today. This is Danny. I love that. And I think this really applies to sales leaders. You have to herd together the group of people to convince them to make sales calls. <laughs> you got you to herd them together. You got to convince them. You got to work with them because some of them are really good. Some of them are really bad. Some of them are just act out. And so you got to do your, you got to do your best because collectively they have to do what really well hit their numbers. So you can make your own numbers. It's, it's no longer just you and yourself. It's you and the whole team. So I think that's very good that you apply that. I want to let our audience know that uh, because you have these great youth that you work with, you have books that are out there. You are, you know, the, uh, all the uh, police, you know, the city officials, you know, the schools that you've been working with. You have all these projects, everything that's going around the world. You've also been able to take this message and, and really amplify it. And that's what we're really excited about because this message doesn't just amplify uh, just in the state of Georgia. It actually goes worldwide. People can use it every day. We're even talking about bringing this message and applying it to the business world that Dave and I consult in every single day. So what's next for this Power of Peace project? What's next for Kit Cummings? Because I think this is phenomenal, uh, the work that you're doing, the uh, actually the results that you're getting. And I want to make sure the audience knows, hey, what's next? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, there's there's some things that I've been planting seeds <laughs> and I've been weeding and fertilizing and watering and praying and <laughs> planting seeds. And there's different seasons. You know, we go through seasons and we don't know how long they are. Sometimes we keep sowing the seed and keep taking care of it. And then he makes it grow. Mm. And I knew it going into 2022, I always pick a word. And that's kind of just my theme for the year. And this one I chose harvest. And that just is my word. And I'm like, I know that I know. I mean, things are, it was obvious. I'm starting to see things grow. And then a few things just kind of boom, 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 right after the pandemic started falling into place. And the first one was a, a company, um, production company out of London that, that contacted me about um, a documentary. And so we, um, I, I signed an option with them and, um, and so we're still in the works there. Um, and so that's a, an exciting project and we've got a great team. Um, and so if that, if that was the only thing, that's a big deal, you know, cause they got a good budget and they're very good at what they do. And so, so anyway, that's been in the works for a minute, but then there's another production company out of LA that kind of discovered me and, and the work and we got into negotiations and now, um, legally separated from the other they're both you know cool with one another contractually um i'm under an option um for a dramatic retelling of the story so for the piece behind the wire new comic code in my life as um uh, a limited series that would be dramatic narrative and um and so i'm under contract there and that thing is moving along um, there's a lot of interest and we're having great meetings with potential funding sources because it's it'd be a pretty you know pretty big project um, with a really really good budget 
and um and so that's exciting and that that feels surreal that's just kind of weird um but i've been praying about this message getting out and then right about the same time i've um i just brought on a literary agent and so the other books that i've done you know i go through a publisher where you basically invest in it you know and get the word out and this will be you know an actual the next one will be a book deal with a, a large publishing house and so you know, prayerfully, all those are kind of coming together because they're all probably 18 to 24 month projects. And so, you know, the kind of stars are lining up and however God wants to do it, it's cool with me that there could be a documentary, a brand new book and a feature out, you know, at the same time here, maybe, I don't know, end of, I don't know, want to put a time on it. God might do it real fast. I don't know. Yeah, this is David. That is awesome. I love it. I'm so excited to be able to hear about all the things that are happening in your world and the reality to say, I've got to look at a system that many might overlook and look at my mission, look at my passion to say, how can I make a difference? And we know throughout history, there've been incredible leaders, incredible leaders who have led movements for peaceful resolutions. They're the true freedom fighters. We talked about Martin Luther King. You mentioned him earlier, Martin Luther King Jr., his family. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Malcolm X, Nelson Mandela. These are incredible leaders who, even long after their presence, their message continues to echo and move hearts. You are moving hearts, brother. You, what you're doing in terms of your message is changing the lives of so many people. And it's so inspiring to know that we, in our own ways, whether you're at corporate America, you're at some high school, that you also can be an agent of peace. You know, on your Twitter account, the Power of Peace 88, you, you have something posted there that resonated with me, Kit. You, you, in your post, you say, I operate under the conviction that inside of every one of us, there lies a desire to do something extraordinary. Each of us, therefore, carries the need to be challenged to do something great. And when called to do our great work, something inside of us wakes up and comes alive. This message today, I believe, is going to wake up a lot of people, and we're going to see incredible transformations in corporate America. We're going to see incredible transformations continue in our prison systems and our high schools. Why? Because I see you, <laughs> I feel you, I get you. If you want to learn more about Kit and the work he's doing, visit his website, The Power. It's actually powerofpeaceproject.com. Pick up a copy of his book, find out how you can become an ally in his work. Kit, Thank you for joining my twin and I and for sharing your heart, your message, and for helping us to understand that we can help become an agent of peace and de-escalate de conflict in our work. Thanks for joining Twins Talk It Up, Kit. Man, I really, really appreciate you guys. You're very, very good at what you do. I wish you all success. And um, they can also find me at kitcummings.com. Easiest way to find me. But uh, God bless you guys. I really appreciate you. Thank you, Kit. Thank you.